Now that we have a little sense of what libel is, let's take a look at some of the cases that have helped shape it. Now that we understand a little bit about libel, let's take a look at some of the cases that have helped to shape it uh, through the courts. The first one is the New York Times versus Sullivan. This had to do with an ad that ran in a 1960 issue of the New York Times that was a fundraising effort for the civil rights movement, and it called out uh, the police, basically, of Montgomery, Alabama for a variety of charges uh, related to Martin Luther King's peaceful demonstrations. Um, now, there were factual errors in the ad, um, but L.B. Sullivan sued as a member of the city commission, saying that he was identifiable in the ad because he was the person who oversaw the police. So they were basically calling him out and calling him racist and had a variety of other uh, claims that he felt were uh, going to damage his reputation. So he sued uh, because there were errors. They couldn't use defense, which of course, defense of truth, which of course is the ultimate defense against libel. So what they had to, to uh, face was a $500,000 judgment for Sullivan at the initial hearing. This is some of the copy that was in there. Uh, there were truckloads of police armed with shotguns and tear gas ringing the Alabama State College campus. Again and again, Southern violators have answered Dr. King's peaceful protest, bombed his home, almost killing his wife and child. Uh, they arrested him seven times. In fact, he was only arrested four times. That was one of the errors. Um, so, you know, this was uh, the statements that uh, Sullivan was uh, claiming were libelous. Now, the question before the court was, did Alabama's libel law by not requiring that Sullivan had to prove the ad harmed him personally and dismissing it as untruthful due to these factual errors, did, did it unconstitutionally infringe on the idea of uh, First Amendment freedom of the press protection? And in fact, the court said yes, it was a unanimous verdict. And what it determined in this case is that the publication of ideas, even false ones, about the conduct of public officials except when the statements are made with what we consider to be actual malice. So when you make them with the specific intention of harming someone's reputation and you know they're false, now we're looking at actual malice and it established this criteria of actual malice for our uh, public officials. Now, what this criteria involves is the knowledge of falsity and this reckless disregard for the truth. Now, what that means is that you know the story is false, you publish it anyway, you know that there's going to be harm. This can be mitigated, according to the court, by three specific areas. One is the urgency of the story, and that's going to come into play in a minute. So, you know, if you're doing a breaking news story, that's going to give you a level of protection. The source reliability, how reliable is the source that you got the information from, that can provide you with protection. And then is the story believable? Is this something that is realistic that other people will find is uh, uh, something that um, that you would expect of the other person in terms of its reputa their reputation being damaged. Now, the next case that we start to look at uh, comes uh, just a few years later, 1967, which is Curtis Publishing versus Butts. Now, the Saturday Evening Post was published by Curtis Publishing, and they ran an article that said that Wally Butts conspired with Bear Bryant uh, to fix a football game in Alabama's favor in 1962. Now, the source that they had was identified as George Burnett, an Atlanta insurance businessman, and he said he'd overheard this conversation. Now, Butts brings a libel suit, and he wins. But this was not long after the New York Times versus Sullivan case, and so Curtis moves forward for a new trial, uh, be and what they're claiming is uh, that they should be applying the statute that was established in the Sullivan case, but the trial court says no, Butts is not a public official, and so they appealed that to the Fifth Circuit, which was affirmed, and so they took that to the Supreme Court. Now, a similar case that came up at the same time had to do with the Associated Press versus Walker. This had to do with rioting on the campus of the University of Mississippi. It was a breaking news event, and they said that Edwin Walker, who was a private citizen at the time, had led this violent crowd in attempting to prevent federal marshals from enforcing this court-ordered enrollment of uh, African-American students. So Walker files a libel suit. Now, in this case, the jury finds for Walker, but the judge isn't going to award him any putative damages because he said there was no malice involved. Now, the New York Times was inapplicable because he's not a public official. So the court case uh, goes to the Texas Court of Appeals. They agree with that. And so the Supreme Court of Texas declines to hear the case, and it ends up at the Supreme Court level. Now, the question is, in light of this ruling in Sullivan of actual malice for public officials, what do we do now with Butts and Walker? And what they decided is that uh, the allegations against Butts were indeed libelous, but the allegations against Walker were not. And the court noted that they were some differences between this and the Sully, Butts 
public figures who are not public officials can get damages from a libel that's a highly unreasonable conduct constituting an extreme departure from the standards of investigation. So what they're saying is that because the reporters got this information without any attempt to verify it, they got it from a single source that was questionable, uh, it was not a pressing news story, so they had the time to check it out, that the fact that they published this based on a source that was not as credible as they needed it to be and they didn't confirm the information, that ended up to be a libelous situation. Walker, however, there was a correspondent on the scene who saw what he thought was newsworthy. It was breaking news. And basically, there was internally uh, consistent with it, o- the overall reasonableness of this story, this background that they put into the story. And so they denied Walker's claim to damages. Now, another case that, that came up had to do with Gertz versus Robert Welch. So Gertz was an attorney, and he was hired to sue a police officer who had killed a family son. Now, keep in mind that Gertz is now a public, is, is a private person. So in a magazine that uh, the John Birch Society had published called American Opinion, they accused Gertz of being a Leninist and a communist fronter, which at this time was, was kind of a problem for people. Now, Gertz lost a libel suit because they said there was no actual malice. But remember, actual malice was applied to public officials. That doesn't apply per se to Gertz. And so the question is, does the First Amendment allow a newspaper or broadcaster to assert these defamatory falsehoods against someone who's not a public official or a public figure? And the court decided no. Now, it was a split decision. It went 5-4. But this is what established that ordinary citizens must be allowed more protection from libelous statements than others who are on the public in the public eye. And so they established that New York Times versus Sullivan had to evolve as it related to private individuals.